On the day of the trial, the damsels rose at dawn and told Amadis that they would go before to, to the town and send word to him when it was time to appear. He rode with them to the edge of the forest and there waited. By this it was sunrise, and King Luzart was, was with a goodly company went out to the field, which was between the city and the forest, and there came Dardan, well armed, and on a fair courser, leading the bride of his lady, who was as richly adorned as she could be, and thus they stopped before King Luzart. And Dardan said, Sir, command that this lady have, have that which is her own delivered to her, or, if there be a knight to gainsay it, I am ready to combat with him. Luzart then called the dame, and asked her if she was provided with a champion. She answered, No, and wept, and the great king and the king greatly pitied her, for she was a virtuous lady. So Dardan entered the lists, to remain there till the hour of tierce, by which time, if no champion appeared, the king was to pronounce judgment in his favor according to the custom. Then one of the damsels hastened to call Amadis, and he took his arms and told the damsel and Gandolin that if he sped well, he would return to them in the tents. And with that he rode on, with his on his rode on on his white courser. When the king saw that the knight approached, how firmly he rode, and his arms how and his arms how fair they were, and his horse how goodly a one, he marvelled who he might be, and asked the dame who was brought to trial, if he knew the knight who came to defend her cause. I never saw him before, quoth she, nor know I who he is. By this. Amadis entered the lists and rode up to his enemy. Dardan, defend your lady's cause, and I shall maintain and acquit the promise which I made thee. And what dost thou promise me, quoth Dardan, to fight thee? And that was when the, thou told, told me thy name, and hast dealt with me villainous, villainously. I make, I make the less account of thee now, said Dardan, and I, said Amadis, care less for thy words. For I am about to have vengeance. Let the dame then reply. Let the dame then replied Dardan, accept thee for her champion, and avenge thyself if thou canest. The king came up. The dame was answered, asked if she would admit the knight for her defender. She replied, Yes, and God reward him. Luzart saw that the shield of Amadis was pierced in many places, and that the rim had many sword cuts, and he said, If the knight demand another shield, he could lawfully give him one, but Amadis was no temper for delay, for he remembered the insults he had received. They ran their course, both lances pierced through shield and armor and shivered, but without wounding, their horses and shields met, and Dardan was thrown, but he held the rein fast and sprung readily upon the horse again and drew his sword, and they attacked each other so fiercely that all who beheld them were astonished. The town's people were on the towers and on the walls, and wherever they could see the combat, and the windows of the queen's palace, which were above the wall, were full of dames and damsels, all marveling at the valor of the combatants, for the fire flew from their helmets as if they were all ablaze, and plates and splinters fell on sides from their shields and mail, and neither a whit abated of his courage. King Luzart had been himself in many a hard conflict, and seen many a one, but all appeared nothing to this. This is the bravest combat, he said he, that ever a man hath seen, and I will have, have the conqueror's image placed over my palace gate, that all who are desirous to gain honor may behold it. But before the hour of tears it was evident that Tardan's force failed, though Amadis was nothing, nothing abated of his strength, only his horse was faint, and Dardan's also stumbled, and he, thinking to have the advantage, on foot, said to Amadis, Knight, our horses fail us for fatigue. If we were on foot, I should soon conquer thee. This he said so loud that the king and all who could all the with him could hear. And Amadis, somewhat ashamed at the threat, answered, Alight then, though a knight should never leave his horse while he can sit on it. Then alighting, they both took what of their shields remained and assailed each other more fiercely than before. But Amadis now pressed on him, and Dardan retreated and staggered, and sometimes bent his knees, so that all the beholders said he had a, he had committed a great folly in proposing to fight on foot, and he, still giving back from the sword of Amadis, came under the queen's window, and there was a cry there was a cry there, Holy Mary, Dardan is slain, 
and Amadis heard among them the voice of the damsel of Denmark. Then he looked up and saw his lady Oriana at the window, and the damsel by her. The sight so overcame him that the sword hung loose in his hand, and he continued looking up regardless of his situation. Dardan, recovering by this respite, noticed its confusion and took heart again, and, lifting the sword with both hands, smote him on the helmet so that it twisted on his head. Amadis did not return the blow. He only placed his helmet right again, and with that Dardan laid on him in all parts, and he feebly defended himself, and Dardan's courage increased. Then cried the damsel of Denmark, in an ill minute that in an ill minute did that knight look up and see one here who made him forget himself when his enemy was at the point of death. Certes, was such a knight ought not fail at such a time. At these words, Amadis had such a shame that willing shame that willingly he would have been dead, lest his lady should suspect that there was any cowardice in him. And he struck a blow at Dardan that brought him down and plucked his helmet off and held the sword to his face. Dardan, you are dead unless you yield the cause. Mercy, knight, quoth he, and I yield it. Then the king came up, but Amadis, for shame of what had befallen him, would make no tarriance, but strung, sprung to his horse and rode the fastest that he could into the forest. The mistress of Dardan, who saw him so rudely handled, came up to him now and said, Seek now, Dardan, some other mistress, for I will neither love thee nor any other than the good knight who overcame thee. What? said Dardan. Have I been so wounded and conquered in your quarrel, and now you forsake me for the very for the very enemy? Go, thou art right, woman, to say this, and I will give thee thy reward. And he took his sword, and in a moment smote her head from her body. Then, after a minute's thought, he cried, Ah, wretch! I have slain the thing in the world I love best. And he ran himself through before anyone could stop his hand. In the uproar that occasioned, none thought of following Amadis, and though, and though Dardan was so brave a knight, yet most who were present now rejoiced at his death, for his strength had always been unjustly and tyrannically employed.